morning, good morning. I'm actually awake, I admitted, because we're all about authenticity here at Grace City Church, right? right? I admitted to Grace, uh, to Grace City Church first service that um, they were here at 8.30. I woke up at like 10 to 8. Like t- t- so so, so uh, <clears throat> I don't remember much of first service, but I feel like I'll remember this service. So this is good. So uh, if you got some people walked out, they're like, you know, that's, that's what happened. I was asleep in first service. So welcome. I'm awake. This was great. I feel much better about the service already, don't you, Adam? A couple of family business things before we get going. Number one, I pointed out in first two services, I can't help but do the third. You appreciate Pastor Adam's new shirt. Stand up, buddy. Come on. Stand up. Look at that thing. Look at that thing. I mean, look at that thing. I mean, come on. Look, that thing takes off like 15 pounds. Yeah. Takes off 15. The metal puts on five in the shoulders. Borelli. <laughs> One of, key, one of the guys that Adam discipled in junior high and high school has got a company now. Cuts. What is it? Cut what? Cuts. Cuts. Go Google Cuts shirts. Like I got like 10 coming. That's a, that's a collective like 100 pounds I'll lose. That's amazing. So those shirts are incredible. Shirts are incredible. I, I, it's distracting. It, it makes you look very, very, very attractive, bro. It's like, hmm. <laughs> Probably the wrong choice of words there. But you know what I meant, right? You received it in the love that it was intended. All right. All right. What, bro affection. Bro, let's, let's, let's hug it out right now. Come on. Come on. That shirt, I just want to hug you with that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. All right, that's my brother, Adam. Hey, uh, help me out. Welcome one of the really cool pastors to the stage. Your elder, your pastor, Construction Chris. Give it up for Construction Chris. Come on up, Chris. Yeah. He has a really exciting construction update for us. Take the floor away, buddy. Okay, so just a quick announcement on all the construction progress that's going on that you've been noticing, which is super excited, uh, super exciting. That barn, pretty cool, huh? Barn is going up. Yeah. So we got that lower uh, roof deck's going to be sheeted next week, and we have the first trusses going up next week. And that that, uh, next uh, level up is going to be 13 feet higher than those columns you see in the middle. (laughs) And uh, so that's going to be epic. We're building uh, a barn. Yes, big barn. I call it our upside-down arc. Uh, (laughs) Definitely looks like an upside-down arc. And... uh, so that, uh, that's going to go up next uh, over the next couple of weeks. Those trusses and the roof sheeting there, going to get all dried in before winter, working with an architect to be able to do all the cool stuff on the inside that we've uh, uh, planned from way back. And because of your generosity, we got to combine uh, two phases into one, so we get to fast track Woo! that. That's so awesome. Super excited. That's yep. awesome. Yep. And as you noticed this morning on the atrium, you came by some steel columns, the very first steel columns in the atrium Woo! by the front door. So, yeah. so finally, uh, the supply chain is catching up with us, and we got that first steel uh, this week. We have more coming in next week, as well as steel columns and glue lamp beams uh, that are on their way. So that atrium is going to continue to progress, and you'll see uh, more activity there. And then uh, off the back side, we have the patio. If you remember that from the 3D fly-through, it's going to be uh, two levels of patio, barbecue grills down below, seating area. We've got a pergola up top, outdoor seating, circulation space up there on the landing, double-decker fireplace, views of the valley. Uh, so we are just days away from getting that engineered, uh, the engineering uh, complete. And, uh, and so hopefully, if we, have a, if we have a mild winter, we'll get to build that uh, through the winter. So super excited about the progress on the patio, of which you've seen none, but I'm just letting you know it's, it's, it's going. Uh, and then out in the northwest corner, uh, we, we've got a garden plan. It's going to be so cool. Uh, terrace levels, grass, walking path, maybe some fire pits, uh, seating area, shade trees. Just going to be a great place to come, bring your kids, have lunch, hang out, check out the view. It's just going to be a great, great spot. We're working on the landscape design on that. And then, of course, we'll get going on that as soon as uh, the snow melts in the spring. And then around here, just to round things out, uh, just turning our house into a home. So we have the stage flooring arriving tomorrow. So this is all going to get decked out. You've noticed we're working on the VOM walls here. We've got those uh, doors are getting, getting changed out. We've got the in-wall tithe boxes now, so you, you don't get to uh, run off with our tithe box anymore after 13 years. Uh, they'll actually be, you know here, uh, fixed to the wall. Um, and uh, just all kinds of little miscellaneous things around here. Um, again, just make our house a home. So that's kind of your construction update uh, full circle. So Real quick, real quick. Yeah. Be a prophet. 
if you were going to put best case scenario, you know, and we won't hold you to it, we, we, we kind of will totally hold you to it. Like, when would you think that we might be able to be done with some of these projects? Like, your best guess, <laughs> crystal ball, <laughs> over under. Um, oh, over under? Uh, prior to 2025. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That was cute. Okay, try Spring again. and summer. Spring and summer. Spring and summer of next year? Yeah. Like we'll be in the barn. Pardon. Yeah, we'll be in the barn by spring. Um, I hope Glenn's listening. Glenn, we'll be in the barn by spring, right? Uh, <laughs> KBI. And uh, Atrium by summer. Oh, man. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. We are close. Give it over Pastor Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Super grateful for that guy. Well, if you're new, um, uh, welcome. Uh, and if you aren't new, uh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Luke chapter 13 is where we're going to be. And it's it's funny. I, I told first service I've been looking at um, I've been looking at uh, attendance and, and service times, and I've been trying to work on getting my sermons to be shorter. And so you know what? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, security. <laughs> Can we get these guys out of here? No. Uh, but hey, you can't win everywhere, right? And so you work on some things, you win other things, you know, you just give to the Lord. But I'll have you know that our attendance is climbing, and as our attendance is climbing, my sermons are getting longer. <laughs> the moral of the story, it's your fault. <laughs> See? See, you're encouraging me. So this is, this, whatever happens next is all on you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Luke chapter 13. Hope you got your Bible. You can open it there. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 10. And if you are new to Grace City, uh, we just kind of open up the Word of God because we believe it's, it's not an antiquated book of historical tales, uh, uh, fiction and fairy tales. It is the living, breathing, active Word of God. And when we open it and read it and study it and reflect upon it and respond to it and obey it, there comes a transformation that's supernatural in our lives and in the, in the culture around us. And so when we open this book, it's not just any book to study. <clears throat> it's a living book because it was written by a God who still lives today. And we've just been kind of working our way left to right, verse by verse, to the Gospel of Luke. We love the Gospel of Luke. It tells the story of Jesus. We have a passion and a commitment to help more people meet, love, and follow Jesus here at Grace City Church. And if you're going to follow Jesus, we think it'd be good for you to know what he said. Um, and so that is our endeavor here at Grace City, to help more people do that and how we do all things. And so to follow Jesus and everything that we do. So we're going we're gonna to look at the Gospel of Luke here and dive in together. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. I'm going to pray for us, then we'll start. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that every time we open it, we can know that it's living and active and true and right and sound and solid and secure. And if we were to believe it and trust it and put our faith in the God that this word reveals and build our life on it, we're building our life on the rock. We're grateful, Lord, um, that you reveal your son in this. And we just acknowledge in your presence that we don't worship the Bible. We're grateful for the Bible that reveals to us Jesus whom we worship. And so, Father, we ask that you would attend our time this morning by your Holy Spirit, moving and working and taking the words that we read here that Jesus said and the words that are processed here in this sermon to change us and transform us and to move us ever increasingly toward being more like Jesus as we follow in his footsteps, living our life day to day here in this valley. We ask and everybody said together, amen. <clears throat> We're going to look at this passage. <coughs> Excuse me in three portions. The first portion is chapter 10, or chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. Jesus and demons. Um, we're going to see Jesus interact with, with, with demons and then religious Pharisees, and then he's going to teach on the nature of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, Jesus and demons here in verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. I don't know if you're like me, but, but when I'm doing my Bible reading stuff, sometimes I, I can tend to just kind of like, I got, okay, I got three chapters to read today. So I just kind of zip through my reading, and, 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 and sometimes it helps to stop and just read the words slowly like I was just doing so that we don't miss all that's going on there because there's a lot we can learn about Jesus and what he teaches us about this, the physical realm, the spiritual realm, 
the, the angelic, the demonic, and his rule over it and how we interface with it. So here's a few things that we can learn about the nature of the spiritual. Number one is that Jesus moves towards the sick and the hurting people. I love this about Jesus. And if you don't know this about Jesus, I want you to hear it this morning. Is that Jesus does not disassociate himself from sick, broken people. He moves towards the sick and the broken people. So if you think about Jesus, he's there on the Sabbath. This would probably have been on the Saturday for them. This was their Sunday, their church service. He's in the synagogue. He's, he's teaching the Bible, which would be amazing, by the way. He's teaching the Bible. He's funny. He's witty. He's connecting dots they've never seen before. The application's incredible. I mean, he's compelling. It's like, as long as this guy talk, talks, all this, and he's amazing, he's preaching and teaching about himself from the scripture, the Old Testament, and he stops, something catches his attention. And what catches his, his attention isn't someone popular or famous or, oh, I didn't know you're here. Come on forward. He's not looking to associate himself with the high and mighty. He's looking to serve the low and broken. And he looks in the back and he sees a woman who obviously has a physical infirmity. She's, she's bent over like this. And, and, and the text says she had been like that for not 18 days, not 18 months, 18 years. How many of you guys have ever had back pain here before? Okay, just a little back pain, right? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's horrible, right? You know, you, you lift something stupid, you, you turn, you twist, you know. If you're like me, you blink. I mean, whatever, you, you know, whatever it takes to, like, send your back out, you're like, ah! And then muscle spasm, and you can't move, and you're sick to your stomach, and you get dizzy, or whatever, you know, and, and you know, stabbing pain like a sword, and you lay down, and you can't sleep, and when you can't sleep, your immune system starts to crash. When your immune system crashes, you get sick all the time, you're exhausted, you're weary, your personality changes. Chronic pain is crippling, Right? And she's had this for 18 years, 18 years. And Jesus is demonstrating to us again, and I just want to admit that, miss this, he didn't come to associate with the popular and the mighty. He came to serve the low, the lowly, and the broken. And, 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 and everyone here this morning w w could be in this one's category. Whether it's a physical malady or, or, or a spiritual affliction, we're those lowly and broken. And Jesus came for you. He came to love you. He came to move towards you. I, I, I love it. He says, hey, hey, sweetheart, come here. He, he invites her to come to him. Would he have healed her if she wouldn't have come to him? I don't know. But he invites her to come to him, and as she moves towards him, he moves towards her and he heals her. Jesus has a similar invitation on the table to everyone here this morning. He sees you. He loves you. And he's inviting you to come to him, the healer of all broken things. Jesus moves toward the sick and the hurting. But number two, Jesus knew her unasked need. I don't know if unasked is a word, but I just, unasked need, her, her unspoken need. Now, now, now it, it was rather obvious, right, who, all who was there, that, that something's wrong here with this woman's, uh, 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 you know, a uh, physical posture. But Jesus not only knew she had a problem, Jesus knew the source of it and the root of it and how to address it. And oftentimes, we have spiritual needs like this. We're spiritually crippled. We're spiritually bent over. We're, 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 we're spiritually uh, twisted and broken. And Jesus sees our need, and he invites us to come to him so he can heal it. Jesus is the healer. And he's inviting this woman forward to demonstrate to everyone there in the room that he has power over both the physical realm and the spiritual realm, which is our next point, number three. Uh, uh, Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to, in, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus says, the spirit is upon me to proclaim freedom to the captives, to proclaim sight uh, for the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to, to set free those who are oppressed, and then refreshingly, not only does he declare the, 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 the purpose of his campaign, he then fulfills it, which is so nice, isn't it? For a public leader to say, this is what I'm going to do, and then for them to, oh, I don't know, you know, follow through and do it, right? Jesus doesn't make campaign promises to get your vote so he can get in position of power and do whatever he wants and cave to the, to, to, to the, to the loudest voice or the biggest donor. Jesus says, this is who I am. I know, I know who I am. I know why I am, and I know what I am going to do. He declares it, and then he does it. So refreshing. And we see a picture of that here. Jesus is declaring freedom for the captives. And he's setting the oppressed free. And what we learn in this, number four, is that Jesus assumes the physical and spiritual are connected. 
He's assuming that the physical realm and the spiritual realm are connected. And sometimes healing in one realm brings freedom in the other. So what, what people saw in the physical realm was this, was this back that was crippled. What Jesus sees in the spiritual realm is that it is demonic oppression. And so he's going to address that in the spiritual realm and set her free in the physical realm. There are two realms in which you and I live and interact with all the time. The realm we can see that's physical and the realm we can't see that is spiritual. And there are demonic forces warring against angelic forces in the heavenlies. And those, those battles spill out into the physical realm that you and I see. Not all things that you see in the physical realm are, are, have physical answers alone. There are spiritual explanations and realities behind them. You're like, wow, this is getting creepy. Well, welcome to the world you live in. Welcome to the world you live in. Which I, I've said often, I've been finding myself saying more and more often, like, that's demonic, that's demonic. Doesn't mean that certain person is demonic or demon filled. Maybe, maybe not, but I'm saying that's a result of the demonic forces at work. We gotta wake up to that, we gotta realize that. Jesus was constantly interacting at both a, in the physical realm and the spiritual realm level. He's saying, You're hurting the physical realm, I'm gonna address it in the spiritual realm, and it will bring about healing in the physical realm. Now, is it always like that? Well, no, of course not. Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's stained and broken by sin through and through, from the weeds in, uh, in your grass to the sin in your heart. It all results of the fall. And you, we don't need demons and Satan to tempt us to do evil. Our flesh can do that on its own. So we're warring against both our flesh and the, the demonic forces that would suppress and put down the kingdom of God advancing in our hearts, in our community, in our life. And so what we're learning here is that not every physical malady is a result of demonic oppression. Some can be a result of living in a fallen world, but some can be. And we've seen people who have been set free in the spiritual realm, and it completely changed their physical makeup. Because you, you, and it's not to say that this woman w w w was even a, a sinner. It's not like she like, oh, she sinned, and then that, this came on her as a curse. This was just straight-up demonic oppression. When we think about the kingdom of God, we need to think of it in terms of spiritual reality working itself out in the physical realm. So we tend to think of, of healings like what Jesus just did here as the suspension of natural law. Because all we have reference point for in the, in, in the world is things decaying, breaking down, then dying. Right? It's like, like, like my, my son Levi just bought a truck uh, uh, from his uncle. He worked it off this summer, kept track of his hours, worked like a dog up early, staying up late, working through the, the dog days of, of the heat of summer, and he, and he worked up enough hours, you know, X number of dollars per month, and here's how much, you know, or per hour, here's how much the truck costs, and he finally did it, earned it, and got this truck that he's gonna, now he's going to sit in our driveway until he can drive it in, in a year. And so he does his homework out there, you know, and he takes his siblings out there, and they, he's got a vacuum. The, his truck is cleaner than mine. It's not even his yet. He, well, it's his, his. He just can't drive it. And so he's got it. He can't drive it. Uh-uh. Anyways, and so, uh, so, uh, because, you know, yeah, right. Anyways, um, and so it's out there, and, and where am I going with this? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We're driving it the other day, and he goes, Dad, how many miles does it have? And I was like, I said, 264,000. Wow. And what I know to be true is because we live in a fallen world, one day that truck will die. It, it just won't keep going forever. And that's not like, you know, oh, the old Toyota demon. Yeah, yeah, those are bad demons. They'll, they'll run those trucks in the ground. No, it's the result of being a part of a fall. Everything erodes, rust, breaks, snaps, comes on. It's going to die. Right? And, and we consider that to be normal. Well, like eventually that truck will like run out and it'll throw a rod or it'll snap something or it'll leak something, it'll blow up and it won't run anymore because things get old and die. Trucks do that, you do that. That's, that's because we live under the curse. Now that was not how God intended. What God's intention for humanity was in the earth was that it would be this place of beauty and ever-increasing, ever-growing discovery and beauty and strength so that people would become stronger as they grew older in eternity, not weaker. The, reverse, the, the curse reversed that, and what Jesus is doing is he's in the process of reversing the reversal. He's reversing the curse so that we don't go from life to death, but, but from death increasingly to life. 
And so what happens is when Jesus does a miracle like this, he's not suspending natural law so much as he's reinstating his natural law for a window of time. He's reinstating how he intended the world to be so that, look, here's the deal. Uh, this won't always happen this way, and I will always intervene this way in the short term. I may heal some people of cancer temporally on this life, but even if Jesus heals you of cancer when you're, when you're 30, you'll eventually die at 80. Like, like you're going to die. There is one doorway from this world into the next, and it is through the doorway of death. But that's the story of Christianity. Death brings resurrection. Death brings resurrection. There can be no resurrection, a glorious resurrection, without a, a, a first a painful death. And so I just want us to be thinking about miracles rightly here. It's not like, oh, Jesus did this rare thing where he suspended natural law. No, no, Jesus is in this moment giving us a picture of what it was always intended to be like and what it will be like one day when he comes back and restores all things forever. So this is, this is, whenever you read about a healing or a miraculous healing in the Bible, it's Jesus giving us a window into the future, which is so exciting, isn't it? No more pain, no more tears, no more darkness, no more brokenness, no more, no more viruses, diseases, cancer, death. It's going to be amazing. You will eat, un, I was, you, right now, watermelon's amazing, but it's still under the curse. Can you imagine watermelon without a curse? Shazam! I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be amazing. You know what I mean? I mean, if raspberries are amazing now, imagine, imagine raspberries without the curse. Like, like, things are just going to get better, folks. If you're in Christ, this is as bad as things get, which is really exciting because things are pretty amazing here. So, uh, physical and spiritual connected. Number five, Jesus has ultimate authority over both realms. I love the fact that Jesus is like, looking, going, okay, um, She's obviously got a, a, a demon oppressing her there. And if I call him out publicly here, we're going to have to go to battle. And, man, that's a pretty big demon. I don't know if I can take this one. Okay, well, let's give it a shot. Hey, come over here, sweetheart. Okay, look, we're going to try this. I've got to stretch out here. And it uh, doesn't always work. We'll give it a shot. Uh, you know, okay, let's go to war, back demon. And then he battles it out. And he just barely by the skin of his teeth casts this thing out and heals her. He's like, he's like woo -hoo! didn't know that one was going to go, but we made it. That's not the picture here. Come over here, sweetheart. Hey, you, gone. And with a word, she's healed. Amen. That's your Jesus, right? Isn't that awesome? So it's just this great picture of like, let's just remember that Jesus doesn't break a sweat when he crushes demonic powers. Jesus isn't straining to like, hopefully like overpower Satan. Like Jesus walks around and victory just goes before him. He, he, he has won the decisive victory in gentleness and humility and weakness. He laid down his life as an act of love. And then he took his life back up, which you can do if you're God, <laughs> demonstrating that there is no one more powerful than him. Right. And then he walks around in the confidence of that victory, not wondering how things are going to turn out. So you and I may be concerned. You and I may, may be worried. Jesus is neither. Amen. He's not worried nor concerned. He's just always in charge, which is amazing if you're with Jesus and on his team. Jesus has ultimate authority over both realms, both the spiritual and the physical. Scene number two, verse 13. He put his hands on her, immediately she straightened up, and she praised God, which is the appropriate response, by the way, when Jesus exercises authority over the spiritual realm and the physical realm, then it results in someone being set free and you're there to see it. You're like, oh, wow. And yet, verse 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath the synagogue leader. Now, let's just stop there, right? I mean, think about, think about how clueless you have to be to be indignant in that moment. You've known this woman for 18 years. She came to you for prayer. You prayed, didn't do jack. She's gone to all the chiropractors. She can know all the physical therapy you can know. She, she's not productive for society anymore. She's a drain on the system. You're having to like give mercy offerings to her, and it's a pain because it's been cutting in on, on the improvement you wanted to do on the synagogue there. And you're like, man, this woman, it's just, it's just she's here, and her family's dead, and she's by herself. We got to feed her. It's exhausting, and and she, you know, we got to help her come, and she rarely comes because it's so painful, and it's just depressing when I think about it because I can't fix it. And and now she's here, and Jesus just set her free. What, what do you think the, most, the probe response would be like? Thank you. Wow. Anybody else here? God, like, like, line them up. This is awesome. And he has the, the, the oh my goodness sakes. I got to be choosing words carefully. How naive do you have to be to witness the Son of God 
set people free and think that it's harmful and think that it's a net loss on your synagogue. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said, no, no, it's to the people. He doesn't, have, he doesn't even have courage enough to address Jesus because he knows if he addresses Jesus, he'll get smoked. He's going to get smoked anyways, but, but, but he's trying to preserve himself here. And so he, he says to the people, hey, look, there are six days for work, so come, <laughs> this is amazing, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Is that the dumbest thing you've ever heard anybody say ever? You're sitting over here, and Jesus, the guest lecturer, heals some woman of a physical malady by casting out a spiritual oppressing demon, and, and you're like, uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, uh, the office hours of this organization are between 9 and 4, any customers that come after that will not be helped, you know, it's like, well, sh shut up, dude, what are you talking about? It's so weird. So it's, 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 ignore the miracle working God man behind me. Um, if you'd like me to pray for you, my religious ineffective prayers, please come back on a Monday. It, and everyone's like, no thanks. <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing, bro? It's, it's just how stupid and blind and naive and arrogant you do you have to be to have this response? And then Jesus answers him. And this is why I realized I misnamed this series. Because the name of our series is Who is Jesus? When the name of the series should have been The Jesus You Never Knew or The Jesus You Thought You Knew. Because every week I read through these passages slowly, I think nobody out there thinking they know what Jesus is like knows what he's like. Because every time I read someone speaking for Jesus, Jesus would never be like that. I would think, really, have you read what he said? Look what he says here. The Lord Jesus answered him, you dirtbag. Now that's the Greek interpretation of the word hypocrite. <laughs> That, he, he's saying, you bottom-feeding worm dirtbag. You low of the low. Because see, these people, these people fancy themselves as the gold star standard for God followers, and Jesus calls them the exact opposite. You hypocrite. You put on a mask, and you, you put on a show pretending to be someone you're not. You, you, you attempt to... to Call people to a standard that you don't even live according to yourself, and, 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 then, and then you pretend to speak for me by putting words in my mouth. I've never said, you worm, you bottom feeder, you dirtbag, you hypocrite. If you won't take off your mask, I'm going to tear it off in front of the people so they can see who you really are. That's what he says right here. You hypocrite. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? What's he saying? He's saying people are more important than your jackass. <laughs> now... I also think he's saying, it's as easy for me to conquer Satan as you it is to untie your donkey and walk him out to the water. It's just that easy. It's just that easy. It, 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 you're accusing me of doing work. That wasn't work. I just spoke a word, and it was done. No sweating here. No exertion here. Just raw power being exercised at my will for the good of humanity and my glory. See, what, what, what the Pharisees had done is they had set up all of these rules around the Sabbath so as to bind people up and tie them up and twist them up so that no one could keep track of them except those who had full-time energy to keep track of the rules they'd made up. And he's saying, you have used a gift that I gave people to become a club to beat them up with to make them feel terrible and to you feel pompous and then for you to exercise authority over them and making them think they need you to bring absolution. When they don't, they need me. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. He's saying, if you would, if you would exercise the compassion to let your, your animal out to drink water, why in the world would, would I not invite someone who is starving for spiritual water to come drink from the living water? This is crazy. You've become blinded by your religiosity. Look what happens in verse 17. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. 
You know, and, and, and this, is, this is where I, w- I, want us, I want this to land on us because, because you watch, and, and Adam and I have been talking about this a lot recently, it feels as if we're in the middle of, of what could potentially be a generational apostasy. Well, like, 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 like we could see, I believe, new religions and new cults coming out of quote-unquote Christianity in the next hundred years because of the kind of heresy and apostasy we're allowing into the church right now through the Trojan, Trojan horse of critical theory, through the Trojan host of the woke joke mob, through the Trojan horse of, of all of these cultural false teachings that are co-opting the Christian worldview by using words in the Christian worldview like love and tolerance, redefining them and creating different religions. It's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. And what's happening is people's like, oh... They don't create a new religion by saying Jesus isn't God. They create a new religion by making Jesus now in their image. Jesus would never, he would never, he, and it's like Jesus would never be judgmental. Jesus would never be unloving. And, 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 and they define it, they, they make statements that, that could be true or untrue depending on how you define the words they're using. And then when they define the words according to the context they're using them, I mean, you find out that it's actually false. So they can say something that would sound true, but depending on the context they're using it, it may be false. Church, we need to learn to discern. We have to, we have to get, our, get, our, get our heads in, and hearts in the Word of God so that we, that we can have discernment when we, when we hear things that like, well, that, 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 that it has the sound of truth, but the heart of the lie behind it. And so Jesus here says, you hypocrite, and then he peels their mask off to reveal who they really are, and they go away humiliated. And here's what I want, want you, 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 you to carry in the land on you. Jesus intended to humiliate them. Jesus wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that I offend you. It was Jesus' intention to strip away their mask, reveal them for the dirtbag hypocrites that they were, undress them publicly, and humiliate them. That was his purpose. If you think that's mean, then that's between you and Jesus. But don't reframe Jesus into your, like, snowflake worldview because, well, he would never do that. Baloney, Jesus came to offend for the sake of drawing all men to repentance. Okay? Because... If our sensibilities aren't offended, we'll never th- realize we have a problem. And the whole point of the gospel is to show us that we all equally have a problem. Namely, that we are fallen, rebellious sinners before a holy, perfect, righteous, judging God. And unless we turn from that rebellion and sin, we will stand in the path of his judgment, and it will be a, you know, like a train over a pumpkin. One will win, the other will lose. And I'll let you figure out which one you are in that analogy. <laughs> and, and so it will be unloving for Jesus to come and see the hypocrite as they are, wearing the mask, false pretending to be someone they're not, and then let them continue abusing other people with their heavy-handed, tyrannical rules and not say anything. And so he, he acts in love by exposing sin, not covering it up. When Jesus exposes sin in your life, in my life, it's the loving thing to do that draws us to repentance. And so I pray, almost every morning, I prayed this morning, I said, Father, um, give me humility. And then every time I pray that prayer, I'm like, I'm like I'm, but, but don't humiliate me, Lord. I mean, I, I want to get there on my own. Please help me get there on my own. Help me bow the knee, Father, in humility, so you don't have to humiliate me to get my knee to bow. Jesus, so, so don't, don't, don't think shame and humili- humili- humiliation are always bad. Sometimes they're very good. If someone has no shame, it means they can live against the grain of God's word and no radar goes off. No conscience fires. No, this is kind of awkward to treat my body this way and to treat other people this way. And like, this is odd, danger, danger, danger. It's like all the, all the signals, like, you know, I'm just making stuff up as I go here. I, I, don't, I don't have a new cars. We have like older cars, but every once in a while I drive a friend's new car. And have you been in a car that was built past like 2010? I don't know. Are you like, whatever? Like, there's all these weird things that go off. Bzz, ding! I'm, I'm like, just let me drive. So I'm driving down the road in one of my friend's newer cars, and I'm driving, through, and all of a sudden, my right bottom cheek, bzz, it vibrates. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like I mean, it just, you could kind of get tingly. I'm like, that was weird. 
And I'm, 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 I'm like, and the preacher's doing my left ear. I'm like, what the crap? I'm, I'm like, so I call him like, bro, your, your, your driver's seat's flirting with me. This is weird. <laughs> and and, and he, he's, he's like, oh, that's the, that's the drift sensor. I'm like, the drift sensor? He goes, yeah, you probably drifted out of your lane. I go, I go, I go I'll drive where, I'm like, <laughs> don't tell me where to drive in my lane. <laughs> so now I'm in a fight with some tech idiot who put this thing in this car. And so I, so I hang up and I, I drift right. I'm like, drift left. I'm like, ah! I'm like, how does it know I'm not wanting to change lanes or like, or like hit something in the shoulder? You know what I mean? It's like something might need to get run over, like, like a cat. You know, there's a cat over there. I gotta go get it. It's like, this is crazy. That was funny. Come on. Don't judge me, you Pharisees. <laughs> Sorry. I don't even know why I'm telling this story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally unrecoverable at this point. I get it. I get it. God has built, <laughs> this is so stupid. God has built um, safety signals into the conscience of your life that if you ignore, you can hurt somebody. That's, that's a point I was going to make. That's totally dumb. But, you know, like, ding, you know, like, like, like my truck's like a 2009. And, 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 and every, if I go like sit without my seatbelt, ding, 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 ding. Ask my kids. I've yelled. 300 times, knock it off. I know I don't have my seatbelt on. It's like, ah, oh, I'm not stupid. And how many of us do that with the Holy Spirit? Right? He's like, he's like danger, ding. We're like, I know I'm not supposed to have sex with someone I'm married to, but it's fun. Right? And, and he's it, it, like, this is to keep you from driving your life off the rails. And if we snip and disable and turn off all the alarms in our car, we'll do something stupid with it that'll hurt us and other people. Same with our conscience. Same with our life. God's like, look, I've put, I've put shame in your life so that you would feel it when you do something shameful. And it would turn you to me in repentance. So, so while Jesus is anti-shame, he's anti-shame through repentance, not through continued rebellion. So, so the gospel isn't, hey, stop feeling shame. Shame is bad. Just be you and it's okay. And now try to overcome that shame by snipping all the wires that turn off the alarm clocks. It's, hey, go, there's, a, there's a pathway out of shame via repentance through the cross to experience true freedom. You're not disabling the car. The car works perfectly and there's no alarm bells going off because you've been set free and now can drive safely your life down the path of, of uh, that God, the God leads you. Amen? So, Jesus is a religious. When he said this, his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. A few things we can learn here about Jesus and the religious leaders. Number one, if you're arguing with Jesus, you're wrong. Can we, can we just say that? Can we just like put that on the table? It's like, it's like if you're arguing with Jesus, spank yourself. Jesus is right. You are wrong. He's creator God. You're created, not God. He is all wise, all knowing, sovereign over all things. You're not all wise, not all knowing. You're not even sovereign over your car keys. He keeps track of all things. You lose most things. He's God. You're not. If you're arguing with him mentally, save yourself the effort by just going, yeah, you know what? I'm wrong. If you're arguing with Jesus about his sexual ethic over your personal preferences, you're wrong. If you're arguing with Jesus over whether or not walking in the life of arrogance and, 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 and self-indulgence or humility and, and self-sacrifice is better, you're wrong. You, you can't keep indulging yourself and the sins and the desires of your flesh and life go well for you. Why do you kick against the goads? The book of Proverbs says, the, the way of the fool is hard. If you're arguing with Jesus, just resolve now in your heart, I'm probably wrong. I mean, does anybody in here want to be the guy to raise his hand and be like, well, I think I had a couple good points there. <laughs> like, who wants to be that guy, right? And if you want to be that guy, you're really wrong. You know, if you're arguing with Jesus, you're wrong. Number two, we learned that the Sabbath was a gift to be received. 
The Sabbath was a gift designed by God to be received as a gift, not a rule to beat people over the heads with. And so we see that the, the, the Sabbath was a part of the Old Testament, Ten Commandments, and it's modeled after the example of God. Of course, we're made in his image. And so he gives us commands and gifts that align with that, with that image that we're made in. And we see that in the Old Testament, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God worked for how many days? Six. Say six. And then he rested on, on one day, the seventh, which was the Sabbath. And so he worked for six, rested on the seventh, and he did so not because he was worn out and he couldn't just go another day, but because it was a part of the, of the perfected created order. That I will work six days of the week, I will rest in the seventh, and when I rest, I will enjoy the fruits of my labor, I will enjoy the creation in which I live, and then I, 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 will, be, I will be rejuvenated to go back and work again. That, that's the rhythm we were made. So, so the, the ditches we fall into are, we think, we think, you know, I live, I live to play, I work to play, and the only reason I work is so I can play, which is a ditch, right? Because you, you think work is a curse, and it's just, it's, just, it's just Monday to Friday, but Friday to Sunday, that's when I live. That's the ditch of falling into not realizing that work is a gift. The other ditch we can fall into is I work, 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 and I never rest and play. I work for my identity, I work for my security, I work, because, I work just to keep myself busy and, and avoid my demons, and I never allow myself to rest. Both of those are ditched. Jesus frees us to come out of both those ditches onto the road of freedom where we can work and, and work in a way that's meaningful and purposeful and productive, and then we can rest letting God run the universe while we enjoy the fruits of our labor and, and letting our tanks refill. Both are acts of worship, wor working and resting. And so he gives that, that rhythm to humanity as a gift, not, not as a command to obey to make me happy, but, 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 but as guardrails on our path to keep us sane because he loves us. And so when we violate this Sabbath principle, we don't violate it in a way that hurts God. We violate it in a way that hurts us. You can't violate God's commands and it not go bad for you. Meaning you can't never work and only play you know, and live off the government and watch Netflix and, and, and take unemployment for eternity and, and, and have a good life. You'll have no self-esteem. You'll have no se sense of self-dignity. You won't be a productive member of society. You, you'll be a suck and a drain and, and, uh, on everyone around you, and it just won't go good for you or anybody because you were born to be productive and to work and to create and to contribute. That's how God made us to. And when anyone steps in and alleviates someone of that, they're hurting everybody. Okay, we, we got to fear that. There, 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 are, there are biblical principles at play that hurt everyone when a company, a business, a community, or a government accepts in and says, you know what, you don't need to work, let's just pay you to stay home. That, that's, that's weird, okay? You can go on the other side and be like, oh, I'm not going to work, 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 and become a workaholic, blow up your marriage, blow up your family, ignore your primary responsibilities, and, 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 and burn yourself out and die early of a heart attack. God says, look, work hard, work hard, and then rest well, some of the most healthiest, happiest people I know have figured out this Sabbath principle of working and resting. When they're working, man, I mean, it is nose to the grindstone, head down, feet moving, sweat. I mean, they bam, bam, bam. And when they're resting, phones off, they are present where they're at, enjoying the blessings and fruits of God. Where are you at? Are you, are you, are you, are you living in that work-rest balance? Jesus is saying, here, look, you've turned the Sabbath into a... Here's what the, the Pharisees did. They took the Sabbath principle and the gift of the Sabbath principle, and they turned it in an ex into an excuse to, to declare via fiat f hundreds of proclamations around the Sabbath that had nothing to do with God's original intent. Okay? So they make up a bunch of these petty rules that nobody could, could follow. Like, like, like if, if they made up all these rules, you had two choices. Try to obey all the rules rolling out of the Pharisee office from the press conferences and therefore become a non-human being anymore or choose to ignore them to survive, and now you're a lawbreaker. Ringing any bells? It's exhausting. But what it did was it set the Pharisees up so that any time they wanted, they could catch anyone around them violating the law and hammer them. That's what tyrants do. They create so many petty rules, no one can follow them, and then they selectively enforce them on their enemies. That's what the Pharisees were doing here, and people still do it today. I know, shocker, the Bible's so ir irrelevant to our life, but hey, connect the dots if they're there. Tyrants make petty laws and then enforce them when they want to put down their enemies. And that's what was happening here with these tyrannical Pharisees. So they had, they had hundreds of laws around the Sabbath that God never spoke nor declared. Meaning they were putting words in God's mouth and then saying, thus saith the Lord. And Jesus is here going, huh, -uh. 
Thus say I did not. <laughs> I, I did not say that. Do not speak for me. Do not use my name to be other good people down. I gave the Sabbath as a, as a gift, not as an excuse for you to create a thousand laws to bury people with. That's not who I am. And so, he, so they, they would say, like, you could only walk so many miles from your house on the Sabbath. So boom, they instantly uh, uh, boom, imprison people in their homes. Because to walk 300 meters was okay, but 400 meters, now you're working, boom. And we don't want to violate the law, so now you can't go this far. So, I mean, they're, they're literally physically, geographically, economically locking people down with these petty laws they made, and Jesus would have none of, none of it. He's like, that is not what I said. That is not my intent for this law. You've taken words out of my mouth. You've put words in my mouth, and I will correct the record publicly, even if it means humiliating you because I stand for freedom, and I stand for truth, and I stand for human flourishing. That's what Jesus is doing. So the, the Sabbath was given to, as a gift to be received, and it had been weaponized to be a, a law to, to trip people up. Jesus would have none, none of it. Number three, the Sabbath was for celebrating God's deliverance of his people, right? It's like set one day aside to remember the, my deliverance so that, that as you walk through life and all seems to be lost, you'll, you'll remember, oh, yes, I've been delivered. I don't have to go to hell today. I'm okay. So now he comes, he teaches in the synagogue, he lives a perfect life, he dies of substitutionary atonement and death, he rises on the third day, and then now for 2,000 years, churches have been worshiping God and celebrating the goodness of the gospel on Sundays as commemorating the day that Jesus rose from the dead, so as to remember that no matter what happens out there circumstantially, their ultimate destiny is freedom from captivity. That's why the church meets on Sunday. That's why we do communion every week. We remember that we have been set free in Christ. And we need that reminder every week because about every hour, we think all is lost. Any given hour of any given day, we think all is lost. And we've been called to come together to corporately remind all of us individually that all is not lost. We've been rescued by the king. There is good news to be had come hell or high water, no matter who's in office or who's not in office, no matter whether, what party is this and that, no matter how it goes and how it shakes out, my destiny is secure. I will live in eternity as a free man, as a free woman, as a forgiven man, as a forgiven woman, as a a rescued son and daughter of God, I can have hope today in the face of crazy circumstances because I don't have to die and go to hell today. Oh, yeah, that's why we call it good news. Amen? That's why we call it good news. That's good news. So Jesus is pointing out the, 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 the moronic irony that on the Sabbath when they were celebrating Israel's rescue and redemption from Egypt through the Red Sea, when they were celebrating, commemorating Jesus, setting them free from the bondage of slavery under Pharaoh, on that day when they celebrate God's king setting the oppressed free, Jesus would heal a sick woman and set her free. You think, like, this is so appropriate. Wow, the irony here is poetic. And this guy's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, this isn't office hours. Bro, you don't have office hours for healing because you never healed anybody. This is, well, are we jealous? Are, well, what's, what's going on here? How ironic that in Jesus doing an act of healing that celebrates the very thing the Sabbath was built for, they would find reason to gripe about. Because the Sabbath was for, was for celebrating God's deliverance of his people. Number four, we learn that Jesus was tender with the humble and tough toward the proud. I love this picture of Jesus in his toughness and tenderness because in this, in this example, we, we, we get from Jesus a snapshot, a picture, an embodied noble masculinity. There can be false de definitions of masculinity in our culture. Uh, Levi and I saw one yesterday. We're at the stoplight down there by, um, um, oh man, the burger joint in Monitor. Hot Rock Cafe, yeah, I, I keep wanting to say uh, its old name. Hot Rock Cafe, and we're sitting there, and, and, there, and there's, a, there's a GMC, you know, souped up, hopped up, big tire truck, you know, and nothing against its GMC, it's Go Chad Sanctuary. And we're sitting there, and his light goes green, and guess what he does? <laughs> Ah, 
And Levi and I start chuckling. We're like, oh, jeez. And I go, men. And Levi goes, boys. <laughs> oh, that's so good, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, my bad. My bad. You know what I mean? Because boys have the need to look big and macho. You know, we're tough. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah. Because your you know, exhaust pipe is that big and blows black diesel smoke from my face. Boy, you're a man. <laughs> like, come on, bro. Come on, game break, right? So it's like this like, macho ditch we can fall into. In, in definitions of masculinity that, that is not biblical. And then we can go to the opposite stream and say, it's like, oh, well, did I hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. Sign me up for your apology tour or whatever it takes. I'll go, I'll go listen for a year and see if I, pfft, shut up, dude. Be a man. Have some conviction. Stand by him. Grow a spine. Move on with life. You know what I mean? So frustrating. So we have, we have, these, we have these ditches you can fall into of like, you know, like, like macho, stupid, pfft, how far I can spit definition of manhood, or just a, a spineless wimp that's no good to anybody. And in Jesus, we have the embodied definition of noble masculinity in being not tough or tender, but tough and tender. He's tough and tender. Look at the text. Sweetheart, are you okay? Like, like come here. I want to heal you. I invite you to come. I want to heal you of your spiritual oppression and physical maladies. And then in compassion and love, he heals her. And then he turns to those viperous religious hypocrites, and he says, you dirtbag. <laughs> and he confronts them to their face, publicly humiliates them, and is in one moment simultaneously tough and tender. That's Jesus. Yeah. Such a powerful example of this. Uh, um, I love watching uh, dash cam cop yeah. videos of my kids. You know what I mean? It's part of our parenting strategy. <laughs> <laughs> it's super fun, you know? Like, yeah, go get them. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when the good guys come for you, dirtbag, bad guy? And so we're like watching these videos. We, we love them. We're just, you know, and, and we watched it. Uh, I watched the video at night and, and it just gripped me. I got emotional watching it and, and it hit me like that's tough and tender. And it was just ra some random flyover state Americana town and uh, this, this, this dirtbag man who was a drag on society, went to his girlfriend's house because he's not man enough to marry her and provide for the needs that he's created, and he takes her kid from him because he's ticked off and because he can, because he's bigger and stronger. He's now exercising that, in a, he's exercising his power in an abusive way, takes that kid, and he runs off with, with the kid because he wants her to be, the backstory is wanting to be paying for stuff he didn't want to pay for, right? So he's an irresponsible child who's in a, who's in a big body and now abusing women with it. Who's got to show up? The men and women in blue. They call out uh, 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 boyfriend, uh, kidnapping, girlfriend's kid, and they catch him, and he's running down like, this street. And so they surround him like, hey, hey, hey. The guy pulls a gun out of his, out of his pants, and now he's got a three-year-old kid and a gun. Okay? Now you've got the men and women in blue who are showing up knowing they're in an impossible situation. Okay? If we don't resolve the situation, we'll get blamed. If we do something that the snowflakes think was mean, we'll get blamed. What do we do? Well, that's when men of backbone and courage step to the plate and go, no matter what happens here, I've got a job to do, and I will do it. And so uh, the, the, you're watching the body cam, but one guy, and, and he's got his long gun up, and he's, and he's telling him to drop it, drop it, put it down, put it down. He's telling him what's going to happen. And the guy is pointing guns at cops, and they're exercising extraordinary restraint. I mean, we will never appreciate the restraint of the men and women in the jail that Jeremy works with and the men and women out on the street, the restraint they, they demonstrate day in and day out working with the most difficult people in our community to bring about a, 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 a resolutions that are safe for everyone. And so none of it, they're all holding their fire even as he's pointing his gun at them because they're afraid they're going to hit the kid. And they're like, put the gun down, put the gun down, put the gun down. We can resolve it. And they're doing the whole, all the verbal judo jitsu stuff. And the guy's yelling, yelling, yelling. He's ramping up. They can tell he's getting more desperate, more desperate, more desperate. And then he says, if you come any closer, I'm going to kill the kid, kill the kid, kill the kid. And then he says something like, my life is over. And he points the gun at the kid. And this guy steps out from behind his cover and concealment. Snap! One round, lights out. Like 23 yards, headshot, the guy drops down. He's running <laughs> like this. He's like, get the gun, get the gun. He kicks the gun away, grabs the kid up, and this warrior that just snapped off around on the move at 23 yards that took out this threat, snaps this kid up, runs around back behind his car, sits down and goes, hey, buddy, it's okay, buddy. But oh, look at the shooter. Hey, look at this. Look, you want a bad? Boo, 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 boo. And I thought, that's tough and tender. Yeah. One moment, warrior snap. Next moment, tender with a child. What an incredible embodiment 
of a Jesus-like masculinity that can deal with the enemy and deal with the threat in a decisively violent way so as to win peace for the good guys and then transition on a dime from like battle-faced warrior to like a... I'm like, dude, I love that guy. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Jesus is that warrior poet right? He is that tough and tender man that can put down the enemy and embrace a broken woman simultaneously. Not like, okay, I was, I was, I was, I was like, I was in tender mode. And then the religious people got, got, got mean and they accused me of saying bad things. And so I withdrew my statements, took down the, the lecture and went on an apology tour. Like so many Christian leaders are doing today. It's like, my goodness, know what you believe, say what you believe, stand by what you believe. Rolling over. <laughs> rolling over when the accuser accuses you is not how the kingdom of God advances. And so we see this incredible embodiment of biblical masculinity in, in a tenderness that can love and protect and care for the weak ones and in a toughness that can deal with the bullies simultaneously. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Number five, we learned that there were two demonic enemies. One resulted in physical bondage, the other in spiritual blindage. Now, I know I made up that word, but when you're a preacher, you can do that. So uh, one of the demonic activities going on was resulting in a woman's physical bondage. Another demonic activity was resulting in spiritual leaders, spiritual blindage. And that's what the enemy does. He will bring spiritual blindness to your life so that you cannot see the truth. And one of the, 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 the works of Jesus, both in his teaching in this word, both in his, the moving of his spirit, is to declare truth and speak truth and impart truth so that truth then can remove the blinders of spiritual bondage that can give you sight because, because it is the truth that will set you free. And if Satan can get the church from proclaiming truth, Guess how many people get set free? None. Nobody gets set free when, when it's milk toast, right, and, 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 and fence straddling in the pulpit. People get set free when God's word is declared, when his truth is articulated and defended and unpacked and taught and agreed with and embraced and applied, not when it's rejected and excused and watered down and twisted and turned and manipulated. Jesus, Jesus says, look, here's the deal. There was this demonic situation that was causing your physical malady, and there was a demonic situation that was causing you spiritual blindage, and I'm going to address both. I'm going to address both. And lastly, oh, we lost it. Lastly, number six, don't lose heart when you do something good and accused of being bad. Okay? So look at the picture here. Jesus is teaching the Bible, good or bad? Good. He's being faithful to the text because he wrote it. So he's being a good Bible teacher. Good or bad? Good. He sees someone in need, interrupts his previously planned programming to invite her forward, and then as an act of love, set her free from physical and spiritual bondage, good or bad. And he gets accused of being bad. So what's the, what's the takeaway, friends? Jesus said, don't think that a student is above his teacher. If they malign you, me, they'll malign you. If they ridicule me, they'll ridicule you. If they lie about me, they'll lie about you. If they attack me, they'll attack you. If they persecute me, they'll persecute you. If they put me on trial, they'll put you on trial. If they're going to try to burn me down, they'll try to burn you down. Don't think that in following a crucified Savior, you'll live a glorified life here on earth. Following the crucified Savior will mean that every day you and I have to put our flesh to death. It means you and I have to die to our reputation, our desire. And here's the thing. I think that the, a church should be the best news in any given town. But friends, some days the world won't always agree with us. I'm like, that's okay. We keep loving them. But don't be shocked if you like love people at work and then they lie about you. It's like, it's like no, wait, no. And, and then you go to justice mode, right, if you're like me. That's not true. That's not accurate. How dare you? I, and then we start defending ourselves, right? And it's like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus is our advocate, amen? Question, 
Would you, rather, would you rather successfully defend yourself against the world and lose being defended against God or have your, your case successfully arbitrated between God by Jesus and then lose the world debate? It's like, no question. It's like, if Jesus has arbitrated my problem with God, he's adjudicated this outcome, he has defended me as my advocate, and God is now at peace with me, I don't care what so-and-so thinks because my main problem being punished by God has been resolved. Now, we love people, we serve people, we extend grace to people, but friends, don't place your identity in what other people think of you because that's a very precarious place for it to, to sit, okay? So, so I, I, I tell you that as your pastor because we're, we're stepping into increasingly hostile days towards Christianity. It used to be culturally convenient to follow Jesus it's not so anymore, which means it's going to come with a higher cost than it's ever come before, and it, and it, and it will take a while to acclimate to it. Because what used to win you accolades in, in the culture will now win you attacks from the culture, and it's weird. And so I'm even acclimate, I'm having to acclimate myself. And so let's just all get there together, right? It's, 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 like, it's like, let's hike Mount Everest, woo! Base camp. <sighs> And pretty soon you're like, oh, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Woo! Camp one. <laughs> There's a reason you have, to, you, have to, you have to ascend Mount Everest slowly because you have to acclimate yourself to the increasing thin air. And I think that's an apt illustration of being a Christian in our culture today. Attack is going to continue to come. It's not culturally convenient. And it's catching some of us off guard. Like, <laughs> The air's thinner up here. Jesus is like, suck it up. You'll be fine. <laughs> Give me a few minutes. You good? <sighs> I feel good. I feel good. Okay, let's go. <sighs> I don't feel good anymore. He's like, that's okay. That, that, that's just acclimating ourselves to the renewed reality of following Jesus in this day and age. Amen? Let's not panic. Let's, let's not punch back. Let's keep loving Jesus and, 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 and keep loving people and keep moving forward. Amen? Don't lose heart when you do something good and accuse, are accused of being bad. That makes you biblical. <laughs> uh, that makes you biblical. Amen? Amen. So, um, my gosh. Let's make this quick here. Last piece. Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Jesus is using a parable now to teach us about the kingdom. What does he want us to know about the kingdom? That it's like a mustard seed. What does that mean? It means it starts small and it grows big. It takes 20,000 mustard seeds to fill a one-ounce tablespoon. Like, 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 like 20,000 seeds for, for one ounce of, 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 of metric weight. You plant it in the garden, and in 10 days, it's the biggest tree in the Middle Eastern garden. So it's small. It starts small, but it grows big. God is saying the kingdom of God is like that. It's small. It's infinitesimal. Tessible, it's insignificant. It, it's, it's almost not even visible to the naked eye, and then you put it in the ground, it dies, it's watered, and boom, in 10 days, it's the biggest tree in the garden. That's how my kingdom works. Don't write something off as small or insignificant or, 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 or too tiny to matter. That's how my kingdom flourishes. My kingdom is not a totalitarian political military takeover. It is a transformational takeover from one life to the next as you love me and love people. It's unstoppable by politics. It's unstoppable by militaries. It's unstoppable by governments. It works into culture like a little yeast that affects the entire lump of dough. A small amount changes the entire outcome of the whole show. That's the nature of the kingdom of God. And he's telling us that, I believe, because he wants us to know that if we're going to be about building the kingdom, which, newsflash, we should be, that what's seemingly small in your hands will be big when you put it in God's hands. Now, just a quick lesson on the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God over 80 times in the Gospel of Luke. He mentions the church twice, which means if you're going to have a biblical, Christocentric ecclesiology, you need to understand the nature of the kingdom. And it's this. The church does not have a kingdom. 
okay? That, that's a misplaced eschatology when the church tries to take over governments and political systems by forcing people to obey God's word through legislation. Like, like, like I believe God's word is good for legislation, and when our legislation lines up with God's word, it always results in human flourishing, but you cannot legislate the love of God into a human heart. You can't legislate life transformation. You can set up boundaries that allows for human flourishing. Absolutely yes and amen. But spiritual, supernatural transformation comes not through the making of laws, but through the preaching of the gospel, which you should give, it should give you hope because it means that as things fall down around us, we are in the best posture and position to make the most amount of difference as we as the church come together to advance the kingdom of God forward. Because the church doesn't have a kingdom agenda they're trying to shove down people's throats. The kingdom of God that is advancing, that will win, has a church to which he's bringing about his purposes. So you got to connect the nature of the church to the reality of his kingdom. And when he calls us to gather as the church, he's calling us a kingdom outpost. It's like you are a kingdom embassy in any given town, city, state, community who are there representing me. You know why embassies work, right? They get placed in foreign nation states to represent a, a, foreign, a, a, a faraway country. And on the property of that embassy, you walk in, it is sovereign territory of a different king. You walk in that embassy, and the, the art on the wall is different, and the conversations in, in the halls are different, and the language being spoken is different because it is all native to a different kingdom than it's currently found itself in the middle of. And anyone who comes into that embassy gets sanctuary from the oppression going on around them. If they identify with that king, that faraway king, they get the protection of that embassy. That is the church. The church is a kingdom embassy outpost in the foreign nation state of the world currently under the rule and reign of the evil one. And we are there to cultivate and then to celebrate and then to spread a different culture. How can the church advance against the kingdom of darkness? By gathering city groups and eating tacos. By loving and praying for each other, by gathering on Sunday nights when everyone else is watching football and lifting our voices to worship God and trusting that as we exalt his name, he sets traps for our enemies. As we lift his name up here, he advances his kingdom glory out there. We do what he's called us to do, and then he does what only he can do. When we worship, it's a form of making war against the enemy because there are some things that will only be broken, some bondage that will only be snapped, some strongholds that will only be given up through prayer and fasting as worship as the people come together and acknowledge, God, this is bigger than us. We need you to take it from here. We lift your name on high. You are God over this valley. That's why we're coming together. So if you can, not a heavy-handed ask at all, but if you can, come tonight to join with the saints to worship, not only because you need it, but because our valley needs it. That's what, that's what we're doing. So the, the, the church is a kingdom outpost that then is to embody the nature and ethos and character of the king we represent. So when we go out from this place, this little 14-acre kingdom out, uh, outpost embassy, we go out of here carrying the name and the banner of Jesus and loving people and serving people sacrificially and laying our lives down for them if necessary to love them and serve them like Jesus did for his enemies. And that's how you change a culture. Jesus is saying, look, what's small in your hands is big in God's hands. Anyone here think they have something big to offer Jesus? Okay, good. I'm glad you don't. He doesn't need you to bring something big. He needs you to bring what he's given you, however small you think it may be. That's how he changes a culture. Jesus wanted, I think, us to feel hope because what you bring matters. If, if, if the kingdom of God was, was, was about political coups and, and military overthrows and, and overthrowing the Roman government, right, then Jesus was a lousy revolutionist because he picked guys with no tactical training, no military background, no money, and no network. And he turned the Roman Empire upside down because the kingdom of God isn't about military coups and government overthrows. It's about changing hearts and minds of people one life at a time from the inside out, loving them in Jesus' name, which means anyone here who knows a human being can be a part of it. That's why we do city groups. 
to get you in community with people that you can learn from and grow from and share your life with and do simple, ordinary life stuff, and you put 5, 10, 15, 20 years on that kind of life, Jesus changes a generation, which means what you have to bring matters. What you have to bring matters. Here's what Jesus wants us to do, your kingdom part, no matter how small and significant you think it is. If you think what I have, the gift I have, the resources I have, the generosity I could exercise, the, 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 the talents I have, if you think they're small, then you're buying the lie of the enemy that says what you have doesn't matter. And Jesus needs big gifts, not small things to make a difference. That's why we do a growth track to help you understand how you're naturally wired and spiritually gifted. So you, take, you can take your spiritual gifts and your natural wiring, bring them together to then serve in this house as a member of our grace team, as a door holder. We call all of our grace team teamers door holders. Because whether you're mowing the lawn or answering phones or, or, or printing stuff out or, 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 or setting up chairs or preaching the Bible or playing an instrument, all of us are merely holding the door to invite people in to meet the guest of honor, which is Jesus. Amen? We're all just door holders in God's house. And, and so we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of people, and I believe that God is advancing his kingdom through Grace City in remarkable ways because more people are figuring out that it doesn't take much. He just, take, he just wants all I have. This is exciting. I can play. I can play. So, here's the big idea when we'll be done. Never underestimate the far-reaching impact of that which at the time seems small, local, and insignificant. Your life is small, your life is local, and your life is relatively insignificant in the bigger scheme of things, which means you are perfectly positioned for God to use you to change the world. Don't underestimate that which feels small or locally insignificant. Here's a story, we'll end with this. By a show of hands, and I think there may be some here, but not many, by a show of hands, raise your hand if you have met or know of Bruce Miles. Raise your hand. Anybody? Nobody? Nobody? Okay. So nobody in this room has ever met Pastor Bruce Miles and his sweet wife. Right here? Oh, excuse me. I thought that cost us. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah. Good, Bill. So one, two people, right? A couple of people. Never under, underestimate the, the, the significance of your life and your contribution. Um, if you haven't met him, you won't get the chance to because he's dead. In, in 1996, in a small uh, North Idaho town, he uh, felt God calling him to uh, build a church. A few hundred folks, big campaign, give to what hurts, engineers, architects, city, the whole thing. They, they built 31,000 square feet for $3 million. Oh, man. I could only wish. Can you imagine that? <gasps> Woo, times have changed. 31,000 square feet, this huge church in this, in this kind of small rural town, and I start preaching the gospel. A few hundred folks to start. It would grow later to become much more significant and larger. The time is very small. 1996, a kid wanders in the back door. And that kid listened to this man preach the Bible every Sunday. And they weren't connected to, den to a denomination, I don't think. Just, just, a, just a charismatic Bible-believing, Jesus-proclaiming church. For eight Sundays in a row, this broken, screwed-up kid would come and sit in the back row and listen to this guy preach the gospel. And here's what's crazy. Leaders like Bruce Miles, good leaders like Bruce and other pastors, they have to have metrics to know where they're at to lead an organization, right? It's like you can't, you can't fly a plane without dashboard metrics, like how much fuel we got here, what's our, what's our, uh, uh, you know, what's our elevation, all that kind of stuff. So he probably had metrics, the boy that came in and sat in the back row would have never come across his desk. He never gave a penny. He never served on a team. He never met this pastor. He never participated in any ministry. To New Life Church, this kid in the back was invisible. All he knew is when he came in, the worship was awesome. The pastor was engaging and relevant. The gospel was compelling and clear, and everyone he met was friendly. They, they, they smiled. They welcomed him. How you doing? They didn't judge him. And he, he, was, he was compelled to keep showing up. His family was broken. He screwed his own life up. I'd already been through one divorce at this point in his life. Eight weeks in, he goes to a, a Palm Sunday service. That's on a Sunday night. And it's worship and banners and donkeys and camel, you know, doing the whole Palm Sunday thing. He leaves the service having never talked to a soul, gets in his car, drives away, and halfway home, the Spirit of God saves him. 
Tears in his eyes, the road fogging and blurred. He pulls off the side of the road, gets out and gets on his knees in the middle of a wheat field and says, Father, I surrender my life to you. And he knew what to pray because every Sunday, this sweet, dear man that you and I will never meet would pray the gospel, the sinner prayer. I'd say, if you want to meet Jesus, you can pray this prayer. Father, forgive me of my sins. I've wandered from you. I've broken your laws. I've tried to do life without you. I don't want to do that anymore. I can't save myself. I need you to save me. Would you forgive me of my sins? I place my faith in your son and in his sacrifice and in his resurrection over death. And I invite your power to come into my life, to change my mind, my heart, my very being. I want to follow you all the days of my life. He would pray that every week so that when this kid left and talked to no one, God convicted him. He pulled off the side of the road. He prayed that prayer. And, uh, and, and in that moment, halfway between this new church building and his home, that young man became a new creation in Christ. A few months later, Pastor Bruce Miles left that town to go plant a church in another town, contracted cancer, and died. I, I think within like a year. That same young man was now put on a new path, had never met Pastor Bruce, My- Bruce Miles, changed his life plan, moved to Alaska to be with his Christian uncle to try to be around some Christian influences he didn't have any in his life. While there, met his now wife, they got married, and they started out down the pathway of ministry together. Life completely changed. Now, here, here's the point I want to make, right? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. God takes small and significant things. Think about all the people at that church that you'll never meet, that you never knew, who worked jobs and, and went without vacation or car or whatever it was so they could give to that church to build that church that became the place for that young man. I asked that young man because I talked to him recently. I said, why did you go to that church? He said, because it was the new thing in town and, and everyone said, that place is fun, happy, the people are nice, you should go there. And his mom, who, who at the time wasn't going to a, a, a Christian church like that, said, hey, you should go. All, think of all of the seemingly insignificant contributions that were made to make that, the culture of that church life come to life that that boy stepped into for eight weeks and then left change, and nobody never knew he was there, even knew he was there. I got a chance to go back and visit that church with that very man a few years ago. There's the church building. I took that with my own, with my own camera, my own phone. It was built in 1996 by Pastor Bruce Miles and his wife and their leadership there and the people there. And then he left and died a year later. This is a picture of the young man who, who came in the, the back door for eight Sundays, trying the front door, couldn't get in. He's like, I got to get in somehow. So he went around to the side. That door was locked too. He said, well, at least get a picture of me in front of the building that got built by people I'll never meet, where a pastor preached sermons that I heard but never got to thank him for and God used to save me. And so I took a picture of Chris Beaton right there in front of that church in Idaho. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What's the kingdom of God like? It's like a mustard seed. It starts small and grows big. And there are people that contribute to that church who are now probably dead. Or maybe they're still alive thinking, eh, was it all worth it? And Chris Beaton is a part of their spiritual lineage and legacy, and they don't even know it. But friends, one day they will. One day they will. We got in the car and drove away, and Chris said, hey, 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 pull over, pull over, pull over. So we pull over, he gets out, and he says, this is where I prayed to meet Jesus along the side of the road. Isn't that amazing? Don't you love that? And now 20 years later, it's not deadbeat, drain on society, Chris Beaton. It's godly husband, father, man, elder, pastor, construction, Chris, Chris Beaton, who's helping this church family build their home. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? That's, uh, that's uh, Evan Strong. Or excuse me, Miles, Miles Strong. And he wanted to be construction Chris for Halloween. <laughs> That's a picture of my, my buddy. We're going to build a church together that's going to continue advancing the kingdom of God in ways that won't even hit our radar. They won't even hit our metrics because that's how the kingdom of God works. A few people were faithful in, in, in one state away. It's still rippling out in the kingdom today. Friends, don't underestimate your contribution to the kingdom of God. 
Here's a picture of Chris Speeton marrying his daughter to a godly man in the church that he helped build. You can't make this stuff up. What's the kingdom of God like? It's like a little mustard seed. Starts small, grows big. It's like a little yeast. Works its all the way, all the way through the dough. Changes the entire texture and experience of the culture around it. I walked into the chapel and with this this week. It was on Thursday afternoon, I think at noon. And I walked in and opened the door, and there were four people, Pam and some sweet friends, praying at the front there. They pray on Thursday mornings. They also pray here on Tuesday morning, or Thursday afternoons and Tuesday mornings, I believe. Anybody can join if they want. And I was with a pastor. He said, what are they doing? I said, they're changing the world. That's what they're doing. When, when, when people get serious enough to give a lunch break or to come early on a Sunday night or, or a Tuesday morning or a Thursday afternoon to pray and to worship, they understand the nature of the kingdom of God. That God can take whatever we bring and take our hands at small and put in his hands that are big and change a culture. Friends, don't leave here disheartened this morning. Leave here encouraged. And I'll leave you with this quote from G.K. Chesterton, that great, strange, weird, funny Catholic theologian guy. He's hard to categorize. He, he said, one of, the, one of the most glorious divine gifts of God to man is that they can experience the pleasure and joy and thrill of fighting a losing battle and not losing. That's the nature of the kingdom of God. So I don't know how many of you felt like we're in a losing battle. Friends, that's a part of the glory that we would get to experience the glory of fighting a losing battle and not losing because Jesus has already won and he's inviting us into that victory wherever he goes. Don't leave here disheartened. Don't leave here with your head down. Don't leave here with your heart heavy. Friends, leave here with your head up, your eyes clear, your heart full. King Jesus is advancing his kingdom everywhere and into every corner, especially where there is hurt and pain and suffering and injustice, because that's where his gospel shines the brightest. And so, Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can be reminded of these truths this morning, that we can have our, 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 our head lifted, our faith filled, our hearts encouraged. Thank you that you rule and reign over the demonic realm and that you rule and reign over the physical realm and that you are advancing your kingdom through small and significant gifts brought by broken, fallible people placed humbly in your hands to demonstrate your power over the strengths of the world, that you use the weakness to shame the strong, that you use the foolish to shame the wise, that you use things like a cross to demonstrate victory over death. Lord, I pray that you would use the people of Grace City Church to advance good in this community as they love and serve and bless and extend grace and kindness and patience to those around them, as they stand for truth, as they courageously declare the truth and, 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 and refuse to cave to unrighteousness but lovingly, winsomely hold the line of truth. Lord, you'd use that to advance your kingdom into every corner and sphere of society for the flourishing and good of man, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.